So welcome in this video on least squares problems. As we have already seen, least squares problems are linear systems where you have more equations than unknown. So basically you cannot satisfy all the equations and you try to find a solution that fits best, that has the lowest residual, the minimal residual in the two norm. We will see how you can derive from this the normal equations of Gauss. And the normal equations of Gauss are a smaller system that is squared that you can solve. So it has the size of the number of unknowns. It is a smaller system and you can solve this smaller system under certain conditions that we will study. So let's have a look at what we will encounter in this video. So here's a short outline first, some general remarks on least squares problems. Then I will derive the normal equations of Gauss. I will study uniqueness and I will show you how you can solve them. It will turn out that the system that we get with the normal equations is symmetric and positive definite. And if you have a symmetric positive definite system, you can use Cholesky factorization to solve it. So let's see. First, a little bit on least squares problems. So we have a system of linear equations, AX equals B, but our matrix is a non-square matrix, and we will assume it has more rows than columns, which means that we have more equations than unknowns. So in general, there won't be a solution unless some of the equations are redundant. If you take one equation and you write it down five times, you could say that you would get a linear system with five equations, but that's cheating a little bit. So in general, if you have more equations than unknowns, you won't be able to satisfy all of them. And we will look at the residual, AX minus B, and try to minimize that in norm. Now, to have a little bit of an understanding what's actually going on here, let's look at a system where we have a three by two matrix. So we have three rows, three equations, and we have two columns, which means that we have two unknowns. And here you can make some pictures. So here I can try to explain what's going on uh, by using some pictures. So in general, if you have a matrix like this with two columns, then the range of the matrix, so the subspace of um, R3 that we can reach, is, well, the span of those two columns. So all linear combinations of the two columns of the matrix. If you are in R3 in space, and if you have two independent vectors, then in general you get, will get a plane. So I can plot that. And here I did that. So RA is a plane in three-dimensional space. And in general, the right-hand side vector B will not be in the plane. If it is in the plane, we have the very special situation that we do have three equations, but that they're dependent. So if they're independent, if you really have three different equations, then this red vector B will not be in the range of A, will not be in the plane. Now, if you have this situation, if you think a little bit about that, then you can probably already imagine what we are going to do. So what we will do is we will project this vector into the plane and then we can write the vector b as a sum of two vectors one being in ra and the rest and then we can solve a linear system with as a right hand side this vector because it's in the range we, it has a solution and that is going to lead to the least square solution so let's let's break that into little bits and pieces and write that out so in general, A, X, B will not have a solution in this situation. So what we do is we project B onto the range of the matrix. So this B hat here, the black vector, is the orthogonal projection of the B vector onto the range. So I write B, the red vector, as a sum of two other vectors, B hat and R, with the property that B hat is in the range of A, and that R is orthogonal to it, makes a 90 degree angle. Now, this B hat vector is in the range, so it has an original. There is an XM such that AXM equals B hat, and this XM 
that's going to be the least squares solution that we are looking for. Not in this way, we'll do it a little bit different, but this is the main idea. So xm is the least square solution and the residual, so that's basically the rest. So axm is b plus r and then um, r is b minus axm. That is perpendicular to the range of a. And that's what I'm going to use to derive a new set of equations. So how do I do that? Well, I say that the residual is perpendicular to the range of a. So that means that if I take any vector in this set, it has to be orthogonal to b minus axm. Vectors that are in the range of a all have this form az with z and rn. So this condition follows that the inner product of b minus axm with az should be zero for all possible z, because then I have precisely the full range of A. And then I'm going to play around a little bit. So I have an A here. I can move that to the first argument and then it becomes an A transpose. So then I get this equation here. And then the next step that I make is that I say, well, if this has to be zero for all possible z in Rn, and this vector here is also in Rn, there is only one vector in Rn that has the property that it is orthogonal to all other vectors in Rn, and that is the all zero vector. So apparently this vector here, so this first argument, needs to be the zero vector. And then finally I move this one to the other side, and now I have found this set of equations. A transpose A x M equals A transpose B. And these are called the normal equations of Gauss, because Gauss found them first, and he was working on um, observations from stars, so measurements of star and planet locations. And he was trying to fit curves through those measured points in space. He was trying to find orbits through them. And as such, that led to least squares problems. So the normal equations of Gauss. And what you see is if your matrix is M times N, then A transpose A. So basically we have a linear system here with the matrix A transpose A, that is R n times n. So that is a square system and it has the size of the number of unknowns. So it's a smaller one in least squares problems. In the introductory problem that I made a separate video on, we had 21 measurements, three unknowns, and A transpose A would be a three times three linear system. So this has a unique solution if A transpose A is non-singular. Now, we started with the matrix A and then formed A transpose A. So you could ask the question, when does this happen? And this theorem tells us if your matrix has independent columns, so if you have the 21 rows by three columns matrix, if those three columns are independent, then A transpose A is non-singular. And let's try to prove that. So I am going to prove the direction where I'm going to assume that A has independent columns. So So I'm going to do half the proof. Basically, I'm going to do this part of the proof because that's the interesting for our application. Um, and let's do a proof by contradiction. So let's assume that A transpose A is singular. Now, as you know, a singular matrix that has many characterizations, one of them is that you can find a non-zero vector, x, say, such that A transpose A times x equals zero. So I'm going to use that one here. So then we can find, so then we can choose an x in Rn. 
unequal to the all zero vector such that a transpose a apply to x is being mapped to zero. So you can find a non-zero vector that the matrix maps to zero. So I'm going to need a bit more space. Um, so we have x unequal zero, and we have a transpose a x equals zero. And well, I have to get to a contradiction somewhere, right? Because I assume that A transpose A is singular, and we want to prove that it is non-singular. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the um, inner product with X. So A transpose A X comma X. This is what I'm going to take. Well, that is the same as AX, AX. So I'm moving this A transpose to the second argument. We have seen before that this is the two norm squared. And well, apparently, this is zero because this factor here is the zero factor. So if you take the inner product with the zero factor, you have to find that it equals zero. So the conclusion is that AX should be the zero factor. But we assumed that our matrix has independent columns. And x is unequal to the zero vector. So now I have independent columns and then a non-zero linear combination. And well, that cannot be zero. So now we have a contradiction. So the conclusion is, the final conclusion, that A transpose A is non-singular. So apparently, if the matrix has independent columns, then the least squares problem, the, the, the normal equations of Gauss, will have a unique solution. And as an extra remark here, if your matrix has independent columns, it means that it has rank n. So then the dimension of this plane in the, in the, in the symbol 3 by 2 example that I gave, but in general, uh, will have dimension n. Then finally, let's take a look at how you can solve the normal equations. And for that, what I need, or what I'm going to show, is that A transpose A is not only non-singular, it is in fact symmetric plus the definite. Of course, symmetric is immediately obvious, just compute the transpose. But the positive definite, what we need to show is if we take a vector x that is non-zero, we have to show this, that a transpose a x comma x is positive. And it goes along the lines that we have just seen. So A has independent columns, which means that if I take a combination of them, a non-zero combination, it needs to be a vector that is unequal to zero. So now I'm going to, to take the inner product with X. I move the A transpose to the second argument. And this has to be a positive number because AX is unequal to zero, which means that it has a two norm that is positive. 
So since A transpose A, which I call, call B here now, is a symmetric positive definite matrix, it means that there is a Cholesky factorization. We can do Cholesky decomposition. So we can find an upper triangular matrix, capital R, such that R transpose times R equals B. And then we can use that to solve the linear system. So that is on this slide. So if you have a least squares problem. What you do is you first compute A transpose A. This is going to be a square matrix that is non-singular if your matrix has independent columns. And it's going to be N times N, so the smaller size of the two, the number of columns or the number of unknowns if you like. A new right-hand side, C, is A transpose times B. And we would now like to solve the system Bx equals C. So that's basically what we have after this step, right? We would like to solve Bx equals C. And the way we do that is using Cholesky decomposition. So we find capital R. And then the system Bx equals C becomes R transpose Rx equals C. This Rx we call Y. And then we find the two easier linear systems, R transpose Y equals C. R is upper triangular, so this one is lower triangular, and we can use forward substitution. And then once we have found Y, we can solve Rx equals Y. And we do that using backward substitution because R is upper triangular. So those are the last two steps. First system using forward, second system using backward substitution. And that concludes solving the, norm, uh, the, the least squares problem. So this is how you can solve the normal equations. And you might say, well, topic is over. It is not completely done. We will do a little bit more analysis in what follows, because this method has one disadvantage. We are solving a system now with A transpose A. And if you look at condition numbers, you can introduce a condition number for a non-square matrix too then you will see that the two condition number of A transpose A is the condition number of the matrix A itself squared. Now, if your problem has a matrix with a large condition number, so say that this number, the condition number of the matrix itself, is 10 to the power 6, then we have seen that you lose approximately 6 significant digits when you solve with it. But if you are dealing with the condition number squared, well, it would be 10 to the power 12, and that is a large number of significant digits to lose. So we will see other more expensive in terms of computational efforts uh, methods. So it needs more work, more operations on a computer that use the condition number of the matrix itself. However, if the condition number is reasonable, then this is a good way to solve the least squares problem. So let's wrap up. We have seen how you can formulate, first of all, the least squares problem. Then we have derived the normal equations of Gauss. And we have shown how you can solve these using Cholesky decomposition and forward and backward substitution. That concludes this video. And I hope all was clear. And I hope to see you in the next video.